guys for joining us today. We are talking with Arthur Mark Nobles about his book, We're for Smoke, Outlaws and Outliers of Panther City. For those of us who are joining you on, us online, please post your questions in the chat. And for those of you in the room, be thinking about what you'd like to ask Mark, and we'll pose those questions to him at the end of the presentation. So I want to start by introducing Mark. He is a sixth generation Texan, born on Fort Worth's infamous Jacksboro Highway. He proudly claims blood and kinship with Thunder Road's gamblers, outlaws, and wastrels. He is also the author of Fort Worth's Rock and Roll Roots and has produced three feature documentaries. So Mark, you want to give us a brief overview of the book and maybe read a little short passage? Sure, that'd be great. Thank you very much. And thank everyone for coming tonight. I really appreciate y'all coming out here in the, in the middle of the week, end of the week. Man, we're almost to Friday, almost to Friday. Um, so We're for Smoke, Outlaws and Ant Outliers of Panther City. Um, most of the action of the book takes place between 1910 and 1919. Um, and one of the things that I did when I was researching it, you know, most of the research I, I gathered came from newspaper articles. Um, and then some of the people were also in other books that were written, and I, I found out more information through that. Um, but I, I was really taken by the newspaper articles, the actual writing in the articles. And so I used them in the book to push the story along. I had typed up the actual stories, and then I would come in and f fill in the blank, go back. Um, uh, it would use it to push the story forward, would explain some of the things that the newspaper story may be left out. And it also, as a, as a writer, it helped ground me, keep me grounded in that language. Um, the writing was really, really strong, and, and I bounced around from different newspapers, and I found it very interesting that none of the articles I came across had a byline. There was, I don't know anybody, anyone's name that wrote any of these articles. And these were, some of them were, I mean, some of them were just like, you know, police roles and who got arrested and that kind of thing. But some of them involved high profile cases and murders and all kinds of different things. But there was never a byline that, that I could see. And I was looking at the actual, you know, photograph of the, of the paper. So it just wasn't on there. But I, I love the stories. I thought they were great. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to briefly, I'm going to read two of the stories, uh, two newspaper stories from the book. I'm not going to read any of my exposition. Um, but it gives you a, a flavor of, of the writing of that time. And both of the stories are going to be about um, a woman named Bessie Williams. Um, I fell in love with Bessie. Bessie was the inspiration for this book, and I'll talk about that later on. Um, but when I found out about Bessie, I was completely smitten. She was nationally known um, as a world, the world champion female jailbreaker. She broke out. It was, they always identified your sex, your race, all that stuff was very important back then. So she was a world champion female jailbreaker, and she broke out of the Fort Worth City Jail and the County Jail, like people just quit counting how many times. So this is June 24th, 1913, Fort Worth Star-Telegram. Speed investigates escape of seven women. Delivery of Monday night furnishes police mystery. None yet rearrested. Assistant Chief Speed in charge of the police department during the absence of Police Chief Montgomery and Commissioner Davis, who are at the Galveston Convention of the Texas City Marshals and Chiefs of Police Association, Tuesday began an investigation into the escape of seven women Monday night from the city jail. Night Sergeant Little reported that when mounted officers Traxler and Bills went to the women's ward at 11.30 p.m., they found the doors of the separate cells for white and Negro prisoners wide open. The sole remaining occupant of the ward, a Negro woman, said that she was asleep at the time of the escape and did not know how the doors were opened. 
The prisoners escaped by pushing a screen from a window on the west side of the ward. Only one of the women is white. She is Bessie Williams, who escaped two weeks ago from the jail in a similar manner. None had been, re had been rearrested Tuesday at noon. And then the next one, is, it's also, it's real short. It's June 27th, so three or four days later. Key, shaped from spoon, opens jail doors for women. The mystery of the open doors in the women's ward at the city jail, permitting the escapes of seven women Sunday night, was solved with the arrest Thursday night at Belknap and Houston Streets of Bessie Williams, one of the escaped prisoners. Bessie was taken in custody, in custody when she left her place of refuge in Battercake Flats to visit a restaurant. At the city jail, she took Mounted Police Traxler into her confidence. You treat us women, I, this reads to me like a 30s gangster movie. You, you, yeah, yeah. You treat us women prisoners pretty fair, she told the policeman, and I'll come clean. I opened those doors myself. I did it with this. This was a rude key ingeniously fashioned from a teaspoon handle. Bessie showed Traxler how she reached through the bars of the cell and unlocked the door with ease. Once in the runaround, the borders of the cells, it was the work of a moment to open the door of the adjoining, of the adjoining cell in which several Negro women were confined. The, women surrendered her, the woman surrendered her key and another similar unfinished implement on which she had been at work. Bessie Williams has a record as a jailbreaker. Several months ago, when confined in the county jail, awaiting trial on a charge of theft from person, she escaped twice within a few weeks. A spoon was her principal tool. She used it to dig through the west wall of the building. <laughs> and so that's why you have scripture. She's caused that. <laughs> See, but at this time, they wouldn't even, even though they weren't really, they were lower class women, they didn't, it's talked about in, in some of the, later in the book that they didn't really search them. And they wore, the clothes they wore at that time yeah. were layers and layers and layers. So yeah, she, she had places to hide <laughs> things. Well, and since you started with reading those, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go off the oh, man, script I'm, I'm from on. the questions I wrote. Um, so in reading this, and she escapes many times, um, I seem to recall that there's a section where like, the mayor or someone is saying that they can use her escape attempts as a reason to get money so they can actually get a better jail. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's actually, it was talked about. I mean, she, she would scrape out the mortar and remove rocks and slide down. My favorite of her escapes, and there, there's one picture of her, and it's not in the book because it was like a, a mimeograph of a copy of a copy of a mimeograph of somebody's remembering looking at the picture, it was horrible. But it's a picture of her sitting on the, count, on the steps of the county jail, and she, she can't be five foot tall. I mean, she's this little bit, but everybody back then were, were a lot smaller. Uh, but there's a story where she picked the lock, got out of the jail, and I also wonder where were the jail keepers? But, so she picked the lock, went to the, and it, it, it's described in the newspaper as a metal door. She scraped a rock from the floor, went to the metal door, and beat it off its hinges. <laughs> now, first of all, how is that physically possible? Second of all, you bang a rock on a metal door, is there not anyone else anywhere in the jail? But anyway, that was one of my favorite. And then there's another newspaper story where they talk to one of the policemen and they're like, you know, well, how many times does this make that Bessie has escaped? And I can just see him and hear him. But he, and he's like, we've quit counting. <laughs> but you're right, they do mention, because there's, there are several stories in there where Bessie is literally taking the jail apart 
brick by brick. And the jail was old at the time. It did need to be replaced, um, and it eventually was. But I think part of this it shows how brittle the jail was. But on the other hand, Bessie was the only one doing it, you know, so you got to give her credit no matter what. So talk about what drew you to this period of Fort Worth's history. Um, I have, I, I just, I love Fort Worth history. I love Texas history. I just love history. Um, but I, I, I'm a native of Fort Worth. I'm proud of where I'm from. I, we are so lucky um, to live where we live if you're interested in the history because Fort Worth has a ton, has several really, really good historians that are also very, very good writers. And we have a ton of books ranging far and wide, all kinds throughout Fort Worth's history and different sections and neighborhoods. So there's just a ton of stuff out there. There's not a lot of literature, I think, so I've sort of taken it as my personal mission to write as much as I can about Fort Worth. Um, and I had planned, I thought it would be a cool idea to write a series of books starting in 1900 and go decade by decade, 1900 to 1910. 1910 to 1919, so on and so forth, at least up through the 50s. And I still intend to do that. I mean, I, I've got a list that long of things I want to write. Um, but when I came up with that idea and was kind of looking around, I was already in love with Bessie. Um, and so I was looking at and her story is like 13 to 16 or 18. And so I, I'm going out of order, obviously. Um, I have started research. I've got, I'm filling a folder full of stuff um, for 1900 to 1909. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, my interest really is in Fort Worth all the way through. Not so much the cowboy, you know, the 1800 stuff, um, but from the turn of the century up. And I just, when I came up with that idea, I had a lot of material on that 1910 to 1919. And can you kind of talk about um, the area of town that particularly this, most of the stuff that's happening in this, it's, down, it's, it's here in, in the downtown area. But yeah. Can you kind of talk about the confines of where kind of the, these things are happening? Sure. I mean, in the story I read, it talked about Bessie leaving her home in Batter Cake Flats. And Batter Cake Flats is sort of east of the courthouse down in the floodplain area there. And it would flood if somebody spit in the Trinity, it would overflow. There's a long, there's a section in the book where the health inspectors of the time are going through there because at, at this time, you know, cholera out outbreaks would happen fairly regular, yellow fever, you know, sanitation as we know it. I mean, we'll get to that with the weir for smoke was pretty much non-existent. And so Batter Cake Flats was just sort of a uh, don't look, don't go. People went down there. There were no real streets. There were no roads marked. They had a policeman that they would send down there. And he must have been the guy that just really ticked everybody off, you know, because it was, you know, there was no sanitation, no city services down in Batter Cake Flats. Um, and then a lot of it happens in Hell's Half Acre. Um, Hell's Half Acre was the convention center area over there. And Hell's Half Acre sprung up in the late 1800s when the cattle drives would come up from the south. At that point, most of Fort Worth was a few blocks around the courthouse and then north up around the stockyards. Um, there wasn't much very far south. And so when the cattle drives came up, this was the last big city that they had a chance to stop at before going on up to Kansas City or wherever they were heading to. And so they would kind of park the herd there. And we wanted their money, but we didn't want them, you know, breaking up our saloons and our gambling houses. So Hell's Half Acre was at the far end at that point, the far end of town. And it was just full of bars and brothels and hotels and whatever. And that's where the out-of-town cowboys 
would come and, and raise a ruckus. So there's Hell's Half Acre, um, and then you know some of it's in Quality Grove, some of the upper class neighborhoods, but, but it, it was, and the, the African American um, part of town was kind of uh, southeast of Maine, sort of where the macaroni factory used to be and all that woof chip. So down there by the railroad tracks um, and, and Little Mexico was over there and Little Africa was over there. So those were the main areas where, where things were happening. So were there any great stories that you found but you had to leave out of this book? There, I mean, yeah, I had to, there's a lot of killing. There's a lot of killing in the book. There's a lot of killing in the book. And I was going for specific kinds of killings, to be honest with you. I wanted, okay, can we, can we jump to the weird Absolutely for smoke? Absolutely. Okay. Can. So I had come up with the idea and was kind of poking at it and going and going. And I, I come down, came down here all the time. And I came into the library one time, and they had exhibits just scattered all throughout the library from the archive, showing up off different things from the archive. And I stood in front of this flag for 20 minutes, I'm sure. Um, this is the very first official city flag of Fort Worth. And down here, it's copyrighted and made by J.J. Langerver. 1912, first and only Fort Worth city flag. And the tagline, we're for smoke. And then this is the skyline of Fort Worth such as it was in 1912. And then this just solid black is coming up out of chimneys. We were advertising and proud of the fact that Fort Worth was completely completely full of air pollution and smog. Because that meant, this is, this is 1912, this is the second industrial revolution. People are starting to move out of the country and into cities. Um, Armour and Swift came to Fort Worth in 04, um, and they were huge. Um, there was all kinds of in industry in Fort Worth. We had three different car manufacturers. Some of y'all of a certain age, been to uh, Six Flags, remember the old car ride? That was, um, oh, it just went right out of my ear. The name of that car ride? Chaparral, Chaparral thank you. <laughs> it was called the Chaparral, and that was an actual car maker. You know where the Fort, Fort Worth City Steel is off of 8th over there? I think it, the Chaparral was, in, was either that building or right next to it. So there, we had car manufacturing here. So we were proud of that we had so much industry, we were just bellowing pollution right up into the air. And then all roads lead to Fort Worth. And these are uh, roads and railroads. A lot of you probably have seen, the, the, they call it the tarantula map with all the railroads that were coming into Fort Worth. I love this, this is Jacksboro and it's sort of written as two words road and it's proposed and it's a, it's a dotted line. So this is even before Jacksboro Highway. Um, but when I saw this and I started talking to some of my hist real history people, um, uh, historians, and you know, the entire country was going through a transition, this, this rural, I can't say that word, rural, rural to urban, and all of the industry uh, building up. And you know the telephone, uh, the electric light was just coming in. We were electrifying everything. So it was a huge change in technology. And this was causing a lot of friction for people. people when people are introduced to new technology, they don't know how to act. Does that sound familiar to any of us? <laughs> um, and so, it was a big transition for everyone. And we, we, we talked earlier about we needed a new city jail and because this woman is, is tearing it apart stone by stone. Um, and so I tried to pick, when I'm picking my murders, um, I wanted, you know, like Bessie represented to me, um, you know, 
a single woman, which didn't happen then, trying to live and, and feed herself and make her, keep herself alive in this time period um, when you're not even really allowed to work. Um, you know, that theft of person uh, was always what she was arrested for. And, you know, I have uh, an African-American. Um, the, the police department, the city itself, was trying to change its whole image. We wanted to be known for industry. We're for smoke. We have industry here. We were trying to get away from that cowboys shoot, shoot them up riding their horses into the saloon image and become more of an urban metropolis, you know, refined. Um, yeah, and we are still, well, we, we, now we're trying to, we walk that line. You know, we make a lot of money off of the cowboys and the shoot them up. <laughs> but we also make a lot of money off of, well, we make our money here off, never mind, I'm going down the street. Um, we don't want to be like Dallas. We are where the West begins. That is very, very clear. Um, but anyway, it was a big transition period for Fort Worth and the people. And so I was trying to pick characters that represented different stratus um, of, of the population and going through different types of struggles. And there is also a point where in any book you can just, there's one too many murder. And so I kind of called it, called it quits there. So is there anyone you want to talk about? Any one of the murders? Well, Bessie. I mean, I love Bessie. And I also talk about, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump one of your questions. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> um, uh, I owe a huge debt um, to the libraries and the librarians and the historians and the archivists. And Bessie, I would come down here all the time researching, doing one thing or another, one little project after another. And everybody was so nice here. And I can't remember this woman's name. She hasn't been here for a long time. But I'm down looking for something. And she'd help me find what I needed. And she walked over to me. And she had a manila folder. And she's like, I have something I think you might find interesting. And she gave me this manila folder. And I opened it up. And it was like 15 or 20. It was all the stories she could find on Bessie. And I was just like, oh, whoa, this is awesome. And I just was reading and reading and reading. Um, about her, and I tried the book. I was supposed to write a novel about Bessie. That was what this started out to be. And it just, I nosedived at about 20,000 words, and that's kind of a no man's land for a story. I mean, it's a novella length. There's, novellas don't sell very well. There's not much you can do with them. It's just, it's too long for short stories, it's not long enough. So that's when I started clicking, and then I'd seen this. And I talked to uh, another one of my friends who was explaining to me what Fort Worth was going through. And so we sort of, that's when I started kind of putting it all together. Um, but I, I, yeah, I think Bessie just was really, just truly one of those people that's just so remarkable. Um, her resilience she had, I mean, you, you need, I'm not gonna spill the beans on the book. Um, but just, you could tell just, from, and there's no records of Bessie other than just the arrests, things, and what was in the newspapers. So um, when you read it, her backstory, I made up. That's, because there's nothing. She just starts getting arrested, and then she quits getting arrested. Um, the same librarian that, she, that handed me that original Manila uh, folder, I kind of kept in contact with her, and like, Six or eight years later, she said she found a woman <clears throat> with a, she, Bessie gets married at one point uh, with her, with, it was Bessie Williams and her uh, married name, and I can't remember her married name right now, um, that died in Huntsville in the, in the penitentiary in like 64. So, and doing the math, we don't really know, you know, because they don't know. They would go, how old are you? And she would say whatever number popped into her head. So we don't really know how, but kind of guesstimating how old she was, um, I mean, she would have fallen into that range. Um, but Bessie, and I think probably Tom Lee, um, his story was really, really 
really touched me, just how, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> it's really, really, to me, a sad and tragic uh, story. Um, I think those are two of my favorites. So, so you, you talked about you used our archive a lot, and um, I think you used some, several others mm -hmm. throughout the area. Can you talk about your research process, and then once you get like your, your hard documents, how you then turn that into writing? Um, like I say, I, I live off of you people. I really, really do. We love that. Like I say, Bessie was just handed to me. I wasn't even looking. Um, a really good friend of mine is over at the TCC archives. And he called me up one day, five or six years ago, and he's like, Mark, this guy just walked in, and he handed me, he said he had like 17 gigs of footage, uh, photographs, archival photographs, and schematics, and newspaper articles, all this information on the, the B-36, the Peacemaker, um, that was built at Convair at the time out here. And the guy who had turned it in had written the definitive book on the B-36. And I mean, I, I, was, I used to be a filmmaker, at that time, I was, I was making documentaries. And I mean, there was a documentary just handed to me. I didn't have to, to do anything. So, I mean, I get the, I go, when I'm, in, the, in the book that I'm writing now, um, I will call friends and say, I'm looking for this. And they, that's why I make, a lot of times people try and introduce me as a historian and I'm like, no, I'm a writer. Um, because, I mean, I do my fair share of digging through files and digging through online and all of that, but the lion's share of what I get is they're, they're like, just here, look at this, or, or they'll at least point me, it's over in that section. Um, and then, yeah, and so then I take it and try and shape it um, how, how I want to tell it. Um, and then again, I'm, I mentioned before, um, there are so many, I haven't read every book on Fort Worth history, but I'll guarantee you I've, I'm up in the 80 percentile, if not higher. I've read most of them. Um, and we have some just some great um, historians here that publish all kinds of stuff. A lot of my stuff came out, like Bessie, there's a book, I think it's by Dr. Seltzer, The uh, Characters of Fort Worth. Yeah, um, I'm pretty sure Bessie's in there. Um, I know Kid Yates, I think, is, is in that one, or Kid Yates is in The Written in Blood, which was, again, Seltzer and uh, Mr. Foster. Yeah, um, those are great books. Um, so, I mean, I will, I've got the books at home that I will do, and then those books also have footnotes, and then I call the people up with the at the library and go, I can't get that. Can you, can you get that? Can you, get that? <laughs> you know Dr. Seltzer's first name? Richard. Okay. Yes, he, he has done several presentations here at the library too, so he's somebody we, we invite to, to, to do stuff here quite a bit as well. Yeah. Yeah, he's great. He is wonderful. Yeah. Yep. That's my fault. <laughs> um, uh, what would be one piece of advice that you wish you'd gotten when you first started writing? Um, the, the piece of advice that, that, oh, I've been thinking about this. I think what I would have liked to have known that I didn't know was that, you know, I. I've always written, all my life, I've always written. And then when I thought I got good enough, I was good enough to start publishing. And so I started picking out magazines or places that I wanna, wanted to submit to, and I started reading those, and I'm like, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not that good yet. And so I worked and worked and worked, and then I thought that I had gotten that good. And so I started submitting to these magazines. And I started getting rejections from these magazines. And then when I started really looking into the business of writing, and especially the business of publishing, um, I wish somebody had told me 
that the competition out there is insane. Um, these magazines, they may be published 15, 20 stories a month, and they'll get six, eight hundred, maybe a thousand stories a month. And so just being good enough <coughs> isn't good enough. And, and when I started thinking about it, I, at the time I was, when I was at this stage, I was in a writer's group, and I was looking around, and I'm like, okay, these are just eight people in Fort Worth. And there's three of them in here as good or better than I am. And so if you just explode that out, I mean, there are a lot, a lot, a lot. So it, not to be discouraged um, and, and to understand that you are good enough, but that doesn't mean, you know, diddly squat. You have to keep, you have to keep trying. And then the per piece of advice that I would give to writers, I'm going to add one thing here, is don't, don't be so serious about it. I know so many really, really, really good writers that will write a piece to death, and they won't ever turn it loose. Um, write it, polish it, don't just send out, you know, yeah, yeah, polish it. But, you know, there's, there comes a point when you need to just set it free and, and let, it, let it go. So don't be as serious about it, you know, just, just have fun, keep getting good, send it out over and over and over again and know that, you know, the rejections you're getting are really just, it's a numbers game. You know, you have to just keep playing the numbers game. All right, well, I think you probably have time for maybe one more question then we'll turn it over to audience questions. Um, so, is there something you would have liked to have talked about the book that I didn't ask you about? Oh, man. I don't know. I just, um, I don't think so. I, I, I would ask if you, if, you, if you take the time to read the book, um, well, just read it for fun. Go through and, and, and have fun with it. I hope you have fun with it. Um, but, but go back and really look at, at the newspaper articles. Um, there's a lot of stuff that can be gleaned, I think, from paying attention um, to the adjectives they use and just, just the way they talk. It says a lot, you know, looking at it from, I can't do the math, 110 years, you know, past on some of these, these things. Um, you know, if, if you really look at how they present people um, and how they talk about certain things, uh, you can really glean a lot about the time, and I think it says a lot about our time. It says about where we've uh, where we've progressed, um, and it also it, it changed the way I read um, the news today because I could see it. You know, I, I'm very I was detached from that. That happened 110 years ago, and the style is obviously different. But and and I have the the benefit of hindsight, um, but it but it does kind of show you, I don't know, the, the the tricks of the trade, as it were. How and I only I don't think it's done intentionally. These people were crank just at the, working at the newspaper. They were just cranking out stories and telling the stories they need to do. But you can see, since we've come a long ways past a lot of the bias that is obvious. In, in a story from 100, 110 years ago, if you, it, it kind of helps to, to step back and, because a lot of times if you're reading a news story, it's because you're interested in it. Um, it affects you somehow, so you, you, you come in emotionally invest to the news that you read. Um, and so if you can pull away from that and stick that in a drawer, and reread that article that maybe is in today's paper or yesterday's paper the same way you read the story, the, the, the newspaper article in here. Um, I know it, it, it changed the way you know, I read things and consume things, and my blood pressure has gone down. I like that. I like that. That's good advice. 
All right, so we're going to open up for questions. Does anybody in the room have questions? Do we have any questions online? We don't have any online just yet. Um, we're going to bring the mic up bring so people who are on Zoom can actually hear your question as well. You were just uh, referring to your research through articles. Um, what, what did you, did you have perceived uh, certain biases by certain papers to tell certain stories a certain way? You know, oh, that's, I didn't, I would have to say no because I don't think I really noticed that. Um, you could tell sometimes um, a story that happened in Fort Worth that maybe I was reading an article that appeared in like Texarkana. Um, you know, there was, the, you can kind of tell the us and them kind of aspect of that type of thing. But, but as far as like, like the difference between the press or the Star-Telegram, um, I don't really think so. Um, the press might have been a little more less flowery, a little more loosey-goosey, a little more let's get down and dirty with the story. Um, but, but not, no, nothing that really stuck out in my mind. It, it, it seemed uh, pretty consistent. What I was really surprised at was the quality of the writing seemed very consistent over different newspapers and not just different newspapers in Fort Worth, but there's a lot of Dallas Morning News in here. Um, and then there's a, the occasional, you know, Texarkana and, and, and El Paso uh, that would creep into it, that would have a story that I thought put a, a, a different light on it. But I thought overall the writing was, was, was pretty level um, and, and at, at a good, at a, at a same standard as far as quality as well. Um, some of the articles would be a little more say this, they would use words that I would not have thought to have been common in newspapers at the time. I knew people were saying those words uh, on the street in conversations, but those, some of those words would creep in to the newspaper stories, uh, and I, but I didn't go back and look and see if I could identify if it was one or another that was doing that, um, but some of their adjectives were, the N word was used couple of times, um, and other types of descriptions for minorities. Uh, and then I would say from the, the news clip, paper clips that you have in the book, I could really tell when they were, they were writing about someone that they considered to be a respected member of yes. the community. Yes. Oh, absolutely. As opposed to uh, Bessie, who was maybe not a respected member of the community, or somebody who was of color. Yes. That's absolutely true. Um, if it was a respectable white male, it was just John Smith. If it was a lower class John M male, it might would probably have his occupation or lack thereof to identify him as down here. Um, females were always, you know, again, you know, there's a lot of Mrs. John Smiths <laughs> at, at that time. Um, and any minority was you know, Robert Lee, Negro, or, you know, Jose, whatever, Gonzalez, Mexican. Um, so yeah, they did identify, they, they would just come out and identify them or throw in a little extra tidbit that would let you know where they were. That's true, absolutely. Besides Betsy, is there anybody else that stood out to you? Um, actually, uh, uh, there's a gentleman named Tom Lee who um, goes on a kind of a rampage. I mean, just sort of a Wild West, gets a shotgun and starts walking down the street um, issue. And I really felt, I mean, I, I just, I, I connected with him at a certain level. I felt his frustration, I think, through the, the stories that they were reading, that, that, that they were talking about him, and the way they talked about him. Um, 
there was, and an interesting thing I thought, there's at that time period, and, and went up through the 40s, I believe, was something called um, the Unwritten Code, Unwritten Law. And basically what it was, was that if, as a white male, if you said something, if you threatened my life, or threatened or impugned um, my wife or children, I could kill you. And when I say I could kill you, I mean I could walk up behind you on the street and shoot you and unload my gun into your back in front of 20 witnesses and then go to trial and say, he said he was going to kill me. I was afraid. I might have to make up that I saw, you, saw him go for his gun. And even if there were 20 other witnesses that were saying, no, I just had to do that. It was a nod and a wink to the people in here. And there's a story with the Yates. And this kid Yates, who was just a, he was a, a brutal, brutal man. He was an old-time law enforcement officer. And if you were doing something wrong, instead of arresting you and taking you to jail, he would just beat the tar out of you and then maybe take you to jail or just beat the tar out of you and you've learned your lesson. I um, mean, he killed people. If you were lucky. Yeah, he, and he killed people. And he had two small daughters and his wife had passed and he was trying to raise these two daughters. And so I really identified with, with, with you know, young girls growing up in a house um, with no real parent, you know, just the, just the rod part of the parent, you know, the spare the rod, spoil the child thing. Um, so I really identified with those, with those two girls. I really felt sorry for them. Um, and, and, and Jeff Daggett, again, Jeff Daggett was a victim of the unwritten code. Um, uh, Everybody has a, they're all, sad, they're all sad stories, sad people, um, and bad things happen either to them or around them very closely. So, I mean, I was affected by all of them. That's why they're in the book. And so, yeah, I mean, I fell in love with Bessie first, and she was just, I liked her because she was a ball of fire, but they all had things that, that touched me in a certain way and that, that, I, that compelled me that, to, to tell their story, to get it out there is at least a little bit. Sure. Can I ask one from the, from yeah. the Zoom really quick? Yeah. Oh, Don't oh. fall. <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> uh, was there anything really surprising? So anything that you discovered that really surprised you um, in your research about Fort Worth? Um, I don't know necessarily, well, that surprised the crap out of me, the we're for smoke thing, that whole attitude um, there. Um, but the, the unwritten code that I just talked about, that was just really surprising to me. It's like, really? We, I mean, this was a thing? Um, yeah, and, and the fact that, I mean, life really was just, I mean, brutal. I mean, I wouldn't have lasted 20 minutes, you know? I mean, just the, the fact, I mean, well, let's start with the smallest inconvenience. They're, well, they're wearing wool <laughs> and cotton and in cotton. Texas. <laughs> and you could walk all over town and you know how many air conditioners you're gonna find? None. None. And the women were wearing twice as much. So I don't know how anybody just walked around in August. Um, but, but the attitudes and just, I didn't understand, I didn't really think about how, how dirty it was. There's a section in there where they talk about batter cake flats and the conditions down there that people were living in. The doctor, the sanitation doctor, were just calling it green slime. You know, they didn't really know what it was. It was just, didn't look healthy. Um, but, but yeah, I think the, the conditions uh, of, that, that people lived in, even, yeah, even it, it was, had to have been miserable up in Quality Grove. You know, I mean, hot and the meat. No, not 
have a lot of refrigeration. <laughs> yeah, unless you saw it being killed, I might just go with the radish. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and that's, you know, an ice box. I, I thought an ice box was just a refrigerator, but, because yeah, no. my granny called it the ice box, but it was, it was really a box that had ice in it, and that's where you kept your milk for an extra two or three days or whatever. I've got a philosophical question then. In your research and, and your writing, are you finding that life was cheaper in the old days than it is today? I think there were def there were uh, it was a much more defined uh, price tags on the lives, and there were different levels for sure. Um, uh, we were lynching a lot of people back then, and no one in Texas was ever not convicted. They were never really charged. They they might be arrested. But the grand juries, for the most part, let them go, and the few that did go to trial um, were never convicted. We had zero convictions. And this is where, you know, it was done in broad daylight a lot of times on the city streets, and so that tells you the value of, of that person's life. Um, and yeah, the way they were described, I mean, she, she made an excellent point. You can read those stories and you can pretty, once you read enough of them, you can see the, the words, the code words. And again, I hate to use code. I really don't think they were doing it on purpose. Um, it's just the way they talked. It's just the way they, they, they talked. But there, you could see there were different classes of people. And we still struggle with class. I'm not saying we've, you know, we haven't by a long shot, um, but we have made progress um, to certain degrees. And, um, but, but yeah, there was definitely, I, I wouldn't say that all life was cheap, but there were certain lives that were way cheaper than others for sure. And it was obvious. Life was extremely hard. Yeah. I mean, if you lived in, you know, early 1900s, if you lived to 40, 45, you were doing well. One, one more quick question. What, what's your uh, educational background? Where, where, have you, where did you grow up? In um, I went to high school down in Crowley. And I was in Crowley because um, my mom thought there were gangs and drugs in Fort Worth. <laughs> well, guess where they went to go and get their drugs? <laughs> right, and it's further south down in here. Um, but I went to high school in Crowley. I loved it out there. Um, Crowley was perfect because, I mean, I could see Fort Worth. I went in Fort Worth. I felt I was a little out of place because my, my, my dad was military, so I grew up all over the country and different parts of the world. And we came back here when I was in the eighth grade. And um, so I'd forgotten. I mean, we came back all the time, my grandparents. And like I say, I'm sixth generation here. Uh, they were mostly Alvarado and Azel, so that tells you my, my peoples. Um, so, <laughs> so Crowley High School, um, and then I flunked out of a good number of colleges around here. Finally graduated from Austin College up in Sherman. Um, have a BA. Um, that's, I didn't ever went back for a, for a master's. Um, but I have, I have lived in North Texas, uh, yeah, since like 74, 73, 74 when we came back. I was 13, 14. Crowley, Fort Worth. My first job was at the General Cinema over behind Seminary South. Um. Uh, so Bessie Williams was your big, I guess, like inspiration for this book. But as a uh, historic writer, what was your big like historic moment or era, I guess, that really got you into being like, I'm going to write about Fort Worth history? Yeah, I think. Um, I think it's, it's two things. Um, like I say, a lot of my family is down in Azel. And you all know how you get to Azel from Fort Worth, right down Jacksboro Highway. And um, I was born in 60, and I think the, the Lake Worth Goat Man uh -huh. was like 65, 66, somewhere around there. And um, 
I remember they were selling ceramic, like yard art, goat men. And I wanted one, and my mama did not let me have one. <laughs> but my Aunt Nita had one out in Azel. And I don't know what happened. I, I let it go. But, you know, the goat man, I started asking questions about where's the goat man? Where's this? Where did it happen? And driving up and down Jacksboro, uh, my grandparents, when my grandmother, my, my grandfather, when my grandmothers, both my grandparents, my, my dad, Ed, and my grandpa, Nobles, and the Rayfields, um, when the grandmas weren't in the car, I would ask them, about different places on Jacksboro, or they just tell me about different places on Jacksboro. They never, they just heard stories about it. They never <laughs> went there. But I hear what goes on in there is, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so Jacksboro, I'm, I mean, I like the seedy parts, you know. I mean, Jacksboro Highway has always fascinated me and the stories that my grandfathers would tell me a little bit. And then uh, the Hell's Half Acre stories. Because again, in the 60s, I mean, Hell's Half Acre wasn't what it was, you know, before. But there was some movie theaters down there and, <laughs> and uh, some BYOB places of entertainment still going on. And, and so digging into, when I, when I discovered Dr. Seltzer's Hell's Half Acre book, I have gone through, and this is no joke, I have gone through four copies of that book because I've just just bent that spine to where they start falling out. Need to talk to TCU Press about getting better glue <laughs> on their binders for their books. Um, but yeah, I think hearing the stories about Jacksboro Highway from my grandfathers and seeing that goat man statue um, and then hearing about the cattle drives you know, that, that led to what Build the buildup of Hell's Half Acre sort of took me down the road. Oh, yeah, I love the Lake Worth Castle. They don't let you go in there. Or they got razor wire. They're serious. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm so glad everybody joined us today. Um, we do have a great lineup of upcoming author visits uh, this year. Um, you can uh, find them on our website, fortworthlibrary.org. We also do a lot of uh, local history presentations. Um, the first Saturday morning of every month, TCU does a presentation here at the library. It's 10.30 every Saturday morning, every, the first Saturday of every month. So you should definitely come out for those if this is really the topic that, that, that brought you here today. Um, Mark is going to do book signing uh, at the round table in the back of the room. So if you'll give him a few minutes to kind of get back there and get settled, we'll do that. And thank everybody for joining us on Zoom and have a great evening. Thank you all so much. <laughs>